love what you talked about in regards to the messaging. I think that's fantastic. And I think if we can really all take home um, a message of empowerment for the people, because often I, I feel and I read that they feel almost victimized or blamed, like you're not washing your hands enough and now we have Shigella, or you're not using enough water and it's the system's not healing. So as much as we can minimize blame um, in the messaging, I think really for all of us, I think that would go a long way. That's an excellent point, and that's really what we're all about. Disrupt aging, have fun, enjoy life, but it's all positive. We're not looking to blame anyone or to say anything, but just giving information, accurate, timely, consistent information that will help improve their quality of life. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Those were very good comments, especially Dr. Sullivan. I didn't never, never thought about you know the, the what we call snowbirds who leave and go to warmer places in their pipes. So that's that's. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, wonderful. Uh, well, seeing that there are no other questions, we're going to move to the next item, which is uh, uh, water rates overview. Now, what we had uh, planned, we had a couple parking lot issues from the vote that we took on the uh, Flint Water Advisory Task Force recommendations. There are two items there uh, that we put in the parking lot uh, that really is going to be governed by the city in terms of how they want to pursue the items because those uh, the city is the one who brought the questions up. One of the items was basically uh, a discussion on rates. And so in preparation for that, we invited uh, two national experts uh, uh, in for this discussion, uh, Dr. Jan Beecher and also Eric Rostein, uh, both who um, do quite a bit of traveling around the country uh, and. Dr. Beecher, uh, you know, I, I re realized he ran Camp Nehruk in, at, at Michigan State University, and I participated in Camp Nehruk years ago. So uh, it's, uh, it's good to see you, uh, and, and certainly Eric, and so the floor is yours. Always great to work with an alum. So, uh, um, no, I'm not a, I just want to clarify, because people are watching this. <laughs> I graduated from U of M, I'm just, but, but. <laughs> but, we, but we had our turn. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, that, that's actually a good, a good segue. So, um, yeah, I work at a place called the Institute of Public Utilities. It's actually been at uh, Michigan State for more than 50 years. And over that uh, long horizon, we've trained thousands of um, uh, folks who work in the regulatory policy community, specializing in particular on economic regulation. So these tend to be the people who work at the public service commissions, public utility commissions around the country, but also internationally. So I've been there uh, since 2002, um, and, but I've worked in the field for 33 years, uh, and a, a good chunk of that specializing in water utilities, water regulation, economics, and pricing. And actually, as part of our portfolio of programs, we actually conduct two water rate schools uh, twice a year. Unfortunately, not here in Michigan, but we'll fix that. Um, and uh, we basically train people in the art, science, and a little bit of the politics of setting water rates. Um, so we're here as a resource. We, uh, Eric and I could probably talk for a couple days, I think. Um, and so we're going to try to actually just hit some high points and then take your questions and, and explore with you what your main concerns are and where we might be able to be of assistance. Um, again, you know, we're very honored to, to play this role and to try to be a resource. So we'll start with the first slide. And I won't delve into this too much, but as a backdrop as part of our conversation, we started to talk about what does uh, a well-functioning and hopefully self-sustaining water system look like. And this is, these are not my words. This actually is derived from work I did in a, in a prior life uh, working for EPA. Um, the 1996 Amendments to Safe Drinking Water Act uh, put forward this concept of capacity and capacity development for water systems. And they talk about three dimensions, technical, financial and managerial. Let's go to the next slide there, that's good. So, uh, and, and so uh, each state actually has a strategy in this area for both new systems and existing systems. So we'll focus on the financial piece. So you see there, um, so this is kind of a, a, a basic heuristic or framework to think about it. Um, and they all do intersect, by the way. Uh, so when you, when you have strong capacity, in one area, it tends to support the other areas, and financial, of course, being an important one. So with financial, we think in terms of revenue sufficiency, credit worthiness, fiscal controls, being three strong dimensions of, of that area. Um, the next slide. Um, so this is something I work on a lot with, with systems, because again, with the water industry, unlike the energy industry, most of it is on the public, in, in the public sector. So it, 
it has somewhat different issues than we when we work with the private sector utilities and the regulatory and rate making models uh, have slight differences but strong parallels when you when you do it well so the, this is my sense of it I mean t you know sustainable systems have to live within their ecological means their uh, economic means and their equity tolerances I, I add that to the equation because I think it's important as well so when I think about a sustainable system, um, I think in terms of spending to an optimal and compliant service level or optimized level, um, that's a, you know, a real challenge today because we have a lot of dynamic things happening and on both the supply side and the demand side uh, across utilities, water in in included. You've got uh, real changes in the demand profile. And then once you find that optimized service level, you try to set your rates you know, relative to those expenditures. And Eric and I'll go into it. I think a little bit. I didn't put the slide in here because we didn't want to. We didn't want to bring math or algebra to the to the table uh, on a Friday. But but basically, utilities set rates according to a, what we call a revenue requirements formula. In that they basically so they set their revenue requirements. What's the size of the pie, the budget going forward for what we call a rate test year? That's going to include your capital expenditures, your annualized capital expenditures, your operating expenditures, your debt service any tax equivalents you might pay, and any um, you know, additional reserves or depreciation expense that you might add on. Each one of those elements should be justified, should be cost-based, um, should be reasonably transparent. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Eric, at this point. OK, very good. So, so that's the size of your pie. The additional steps in rate making involve what we call cost allocation. How do we assign costs based on who's using the product, uh, commercial, residential, um, industrial, but also even within those classes, you know, there's different methodologies for allocating costs, sending good price signals, but also, you know, within this context, uh, one thing Eric and I talk a lot about is how to also ensure universal service affordability. We were had the good opportunity to work together on this uh, over the years, including recently in Detroit. Um, so we'll go to the next one. So one of the things I do at the Institute for fun, because I'm a utility nerd, um, I, I, track, uh, I track household expenditures and uh, CPI data related to the, t all the, across the utility sectors. So the pie chart is this, is, this is on average in the US what people pay for utility services. This is a family of four uh, typical expenditures. But of course, averages mask a lot of variation and so some people might not they might not have a gas bill if they don't have gas heat or they might not pay a water bill if it's embedded in their rent so these are just very very aggregate numbers the chart on the right is an interesting one this is something I've been following again across the utilities but this is a snapshot for water the line that you see is actually the CPI for water and as I look at I didn't bring the the whole chart but the if you look at price inflation across utilities, you see really different patterns, patterns for telecommunications versus energy versus water. Water is, is, is a very inflationary trend. The, the, uh, the, in other words, the rate of uh, rate increases or price increases for water is much higher than the overall rate of inflation. Why is that? Well, we have a whole basket of reasons, but it's being driven by the construction cost cycle that we're in. And in many respects, in the, um, it, it, it's being reflected by the, the movement toward full cost pricing, where communities have to raise their revenues to support the cost of service. Uh, they're, they're really more dependent on those rate revenues than, say, uh, grant subsidies that might have been available in the past for both water and wastewater. Uh, these numbers, by the way, are water and wastewater combined. Now, the, the bar chart part of the graph, though, that's our water expenditures. So you can actually see there. That sort of reveals something, and that is expenditures, are, household expenditures are not rising at the same rate as the price, and that's because our water usage um, has, has flattened or even declined for various reasons. So even in a, uh, all other things being equal in, in, in a community without any population loss, we're using water more efficiently because pretty much every way we use water is, is more uh, efficient. And, um, and we're seeing that uh, those patterns of usage, another project Eric and I have worked on over the years. So the combination of the higher rate with the lower usage is providing a little bit of relief on those bills. But we do anticipate um, some fair 
some, and go to the next slide, some you know, fairly significant cost pressure on, uh, on water systems. So there I've kind of summarized it. Um, I also participate on the Infrastructure uh, Commission, and we've talked a lot about this, uh, you know, the, the need for infrastructure investment across all, all utility sectors, water and wastewater, perhaps in particular. So we've got operating cost pressures, uh, we've got the move to full cost pricing, and again, this combination of declining demand and for legacy cities, the loss of population, loss of economic activity, those leave you with a lot of what we call stranded investment. You know, is, these are high fixed cost industries, so that'll be um, an issue that you have to deal with. Okay, so next slide. Um, I actually came across this. I'm having a little trouble actually figuring out, what, you know, because of the, there were amendments, but actually under uh, Flint's own city charter, uh, there was actually a statement about uh, the importance of, of pricing correctly, you know, going back, you know, many, many decades. Um, so when you think again about the sustainable water system, I think Eric and I would agree that um, the, you want those, those prices should reflect true costs and those costs uh, should be, within those costs, you want to see minimal, if any, use of transfers of water funds to other purposes. Um, I didn't bring a lot in this presentation, but a lot of my work is focused on sort of the regressive nature of utility bills. Utility bills take a bigger bite out of the budget of the low-income household than the higher-income household. That's just a statistical reality. Taxes, on the other hand, provide a chance for progressive uh, payment. Um, so you, 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 you do, by practice, by long tradition, by long policy principle, you do not use utility rates as a tax instrument or a wealth transfer instrument because it tends to have those regressive impacts. And when you do that, not only are you um, introducing an efficiency, you're also aggravating some fairly serious equity issues. So it's something I'm very focused on these days. You know, Eric and I have been around this for a long time, and we've taught the economic paradigm of water pricing, but we also, I, both, and I think as we become more experienced and uh, maybe a little wiser with age, you know, we emphasize that uh, we have to fundamentally, we have to still remember these, these, these services are fundamentally about public health and welfare and safety, and we need to strive for universal service and, and access and public health. It's just essential. Okay, so next one. Um, so if you squint, what you'll see is these uh, kind of weird colors I chose for some reason. Uh, you see sort of these are revenues to Flint, and this is something Mr. Scorsoni is far more expert on than I am, but what you see is the decline in revenues from other sources, but you see this, uh, you know, rising revenue <coughs> from, you know, water and wastewater bills. And that's a picture I don't like to see, frankly, because it, it does, again, it, ra it raises a flag to me about, about how we're using water rates and how um, we need to be cognizant of the implications of that. Okay, uh, and I didn't include the detail on, um, on all of this, but um, you know what, what we can talk about a little bit is what's embedded in those rates. Okay, next. Um, so I basically know the Raftelis firm very well, uh, as does Eric. I mean, we've worked with folks from there um, over many, many years. They did two rate studies, one in 2014 for the Treasurer, I believe, and one in 2016. So I'm, I'm pretty much deferring to them. I've gone back and forth on a couple of data points, and there's a couple things um, I'm still interested in finding out more about, but basically I'll defer to them on their assumptions about cost and budgetary information. Um, and so there's sort of your pie, as I was talking about. Remember, we're trying to establish a revenue pie, your budget going forward. So there's your key challenge. These are, some things are very hard to control these days, you know, right, retirement, retiree health care, for example. But here you've got a, a profile that in some ways I think, and I want Eric to speak to this later, but it's a little atypical. We've got operating costs. We've got Pretty, pretty enormous, for the Midwest, pretty enormous uh, supply costs and capital costs associated with the debt service for KWA and fairly substantial transfers to the city. There are basically four bites that, uh, of the apple in terms of transfers. There's uh, direct, indirect, payment in lieu of taxes, and then other. Um, it's, I, I would emphasize it's not out of the realm of, of practice and good practice to have some payments back to cities, certainly direct costs if they can be well documented, possibly even a nominal 
uh, return, if there's a risk uh, sharing or, or, or uh, cost sharing. But it ha in any case, uh, it sh should certainly be transparent and well documented. And then you can see there the, some of the breakdowns of those operating costs on the right. Okay, so next. Thank you. Um, so they came up, uh, and this is actually important um, in the water realm to, to talk about bills instead of rates. You know, we, the headline is always about the rate, when in fact I think in, in terms of the uh, impact on folks and the understandability, we really should be talking about bills, because again, the rate may be going higher up, or going up higher than the bill. So in the Raftel study, they provided this summary, and they showed how the bill had, uh, with I think there were two increases, rate increases in 2011 and another in 2012, if I'm remembering correctly. And then there was, but there was a legal challenge that brought the, uh, that, that typical, quote unquote, typical bill for 3,700 gallons, um, you know, to, brought that down to about $54. Now, I didn't include charts, but you know, one of the things we do is we look at those bills relative to ability to pay, relative to household expenditures, relative to income. That's a high bill. That's a, that's, um, and there are more sophisticated ways of, of analyzing that today because there's a group over at North Carolina, and I think you can plug in the bills and then you can see the census data. So you can actually get a real, a much more granular look at your service population and who will be struggling to pay that bill. Um, over the years of my career, we've talked about benchmarks for what's affordable. The, and we've always struggled with, with that, but um, the EPA in the past has used a, a formula in the range of 2.5% of, of income for, um, for water, 2% for water and wastewater for a total of 4.5%. Uh, but as we know, again, those, those numbers can mask uh, some fairly uh, substantial ranges of, of burden. Okay, next. So we won't go into the detail here. Um, uh, th this is, a, as you can imagine, the uh, concept of affordability and avoidance of disconnection of arrearages and, these, and, uh, and frankly, water poverty, energy poverty. These are longstanding issues. And um, I actually worked on a report decades ago at, uh, when I was at an institute in Ohio, I won't, say, I won't mention, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but on, on this issue of uh, policies to avoid disconnection. There's lots and lots of good ideas out there. Some of this comes down to, again, you know, political will as well as, of course, financial capability to, to do these. The, 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 um, the issue of poverty, of course, is beyond the scope of any, any or pretty much any public utility. You know, these are, issue, these are intractable issues. They, they require attention from larger insti you know, governmental institutions, whether local, state, federal. But there are, there are policies and strategies that are available. There are, um, there are things we can do to ensure, again, uh, against, uh, against disconnection and, and, and try to extend service. Okay, next. Um, so I've been kicking around some ideas and playing with a spreadsheet even. Some, and so th this is really preliminary off the top of my head stuff. But um, as a basic thing, let's move from cubic feet to gallons because I don't even know what a cubic feet is, a foot is, and I've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I, you know, uh, everybody knows what a gallon of milk looks like. Let's, let's get a pricing metric that makes sense there. I think the people of Flint, we need, to, we need to get back to basics here. We need to be very public health oriented and start with that. Um, try, to, try to strive perhaps for a, a multi-year uh, fl but flexible rate plan. In other words, th with the idea that down the line, yes, the rates will be revisited in terms of economic price signals and fiscal uh, health issues and all of that. But, it, but the, at the beginning, start to really, uh, you know, get, get, really get back to basics. Um, the World Health Organization makes a recommendation of something in the range of 25 gallons per person per day. So again, going back to that four-person household, Personally, I'd like to see a rate, um, it, it, you know, an affordable rate for about 3,000 gallons, again, to ensure that there's safety and health in that home. Um, I think it's doable. I don't think, I think we need to um, strive for something, something in that range. At least that gives us a starting point for a conversation. Uh, we need to get rid of any un, unjustified and uneconomic transfers. Um, that, that we sh simply should not be burdening water customers with, with uh, you know, with with balancing the budget, the local budget. Uh, I th I think, and again, I've taught rate rates for so many years, and it's become more clear to me in the not just in the water context, but in energy too. People need to feel some sense of control over their rates, and 
Dr. Mona used the term empowerment earlier, and I think it, it's relevant here. There's a, big, there's a big debate in utilities about raising the fixed charge because so much of the costs are fixed, and that seems really logical. It actually doesn't necessarily send good price signals, and it tends to have, um, it tends to, again, have a regressive effect. So I would actually resist that impulse, get that fixed charge down, and again, by having more of the cost and the variable charge, you give, you give the family a, a better sense of control and understanding of their bill. Uh, I think we should think about payment incentives. And again, going back, I actually found evidence, I hadn't even known about this, that um, there used to be some uh, possible bill discounts for prepay, for so like timely payment on the part of customers. Again, uh, why, not, why not consider the idea that uh, customers who are good uh, you know, have a good track record, maybe they, that's recognized. Um, again, there's, uh, there's other ways to provide assistance. Uh, there's no right answer to this, uh, but again, looking at <coughs> possible fixed charge waiver vouchers. Uh, lifeline rates, are what I, is what generally I, I like the idea of, um, you know, again, I didn't put, put specific rates as I mentioned in here. And of course, we have to have cost control uh, across the board. And one possibility within, within the larger picture is to think about rewarding some of those managers for hitting targets for water quality, uh, water improvement. Um, we have a lot of policy goals here, right? That's what this group is, is really advancing. So why not tie those to managerial incentives? Possibly even think down the line of some sort of a profit sharing or you know, some things you borrow from cooperative management of, of utilities. Again, to feel, to, to help Flint and its citizens uh, uh, feel some participation and ownership in their system going forward. Those are just, again, some thoughts to get the conversation started. So um, I think that might be it. Is that it? Very good. So um, poor Eric, you know, as, as you know, can't get a word ed edgewise with me, but I'll, I'll let you uh, let me try. correct all my mistakes. Thank you, Eric. Um, I think my comments, I don't have any slides. Um, I think I'd like to speak to some of the, the basic realities of what we're dealing with for Flint. Number one, um, when we look at water uh, rates here, um, both of us have been authors of the standard practice manuals for setting rates. They don't apply here. We got to think of other, th other approaches here because there is no textbook that speaks to this issue. We also, I think, need to understand some and be honest about some basic realities of where we are now. Flint's rates are really high. They're higher than they should be. They're higher than they should be because of some of them are understandable and some of them just plain rotten reasons. They're high because of the fact that the water supply costs are quite high. They're high because of inappropriate transfers to the general fund by emergency managers, thank you, uh, and others. Um, so the, f the prices that, that, um, that the Flint population faces are too high and it is faced by a population that has a overwhelming level of poverty. And so the standard approaches that we think about around, when we talk about uh, all the stuff around the country don't necessarily apply well here. Um, there are a number of things that I think can be done. When we look at the cost structure, bluntly, I don't think we have any idea of what it's ultimately going to be. We know that there's going to be dollars coming in from the state, hopefully from the federal government. And so our ability to understand what really is self-sustaining is going to have to be deferred until we have a really better and clearer picture about what our overall cost structure is. In the meantime, we have to provide water service at an affordable rate. Um, affordability also goes beyond this issue, and there's just some basic mechanics that have nothing to do with water rate making, but are really, really important when you're talking about people being able to afford the services that they're providing. We have uh, plenty of experience in the state, and I've, I've been working a lot in Detroit um, some of these mechanics go to simple things like actually being able to get through to the customer service office and be able to have your, your questions and your complaints dealt with 
in a reasonable and compassionate way. We often find in Detroit that the people that are calling and concerned about being uh, facing a potential shutoff, that are worried about their water bills, facing a whole host of other issues that go well beyond their water rate issues. In Detroit, we also have worked really hard to affect a set of policies so that if any customer declares that they can't afford to pay their bill, they will not face a shutoff. Getting that policy that's been articulated by the directors and others actually executed on the ground, day to day, with customer service representatives, with assistance providers, is really hard. And so I encourage everybody to be thinking about not just the basic policies and the, and the theories, if you will, of water rates, but also to be very cognizant of the mechanics involved in delivering services in a way that's compassionate and recognizes the affordability constraints of the customers that we're serving. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. I thought you were thanking me. <laughs> Thank you both very much for your comments. Um, I know that before this became a water quality crisis, um, I started working with residents who couldn't afford the water and who faced shutoffs and some who had had shutoffs but hadn't yet been identified and were afraid their children were going to be taken and put in protective custody. I worked with uh, residents who were trying to obtain some financial assistance and all of the financial assistance of the residents which went, came through one channel where I believe there were two people manning the phones and so the access to that assistance was almost non-existent. I know that um, of course for residents who had had their water shut off the cost to have it turned back on was designed <laughs> to be prohibitive. So I really appreciate uh, what you have to say. Um, I wondered uh, when you look at um, mounting costs and uh, municipalities that just can't cover those costs, um, does that explain a trend toward some, um, some municipalities and states encouraging the privatization of the water uh, along with um, those who have wealth being aware or comfortable with the fact that privatized water is more expensive and they can afford it, they just don't want to pay for the water for others. I'm just wondering if, if what we've seen as a move toward privatization in Michigan is a result of wealthy people being able to afford to take care of themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question and actually I've spent a fair amount of my um, research on, on the issue of privatization because a lot of the, the regulatory paradigm is aimed toward, toward privately owned systems. In this country, there's actually a very, a very small minority of investor-owned or what we call privately owned ut uh, water utilities that own all of the assets and are regulated in the, really in the exact same manner as DTE or consumers energy. They're under, the, they're under public service commission uh, control. Uh, as a side, uh, Michigan's one of only five states that actually does not have, uh, presently does not have authority for the water sector because we really have no private uh, presence in terms of that model, okay, that model. Um, there is no trend in that model, despite, you know, the occasional headline, they're actually, the, the data don't really support that either globally, nationally, or in the state. Um, and one of the key reasons is actually if you acquire and own and run and regulate a water system, you add to that revenue requirement I, that I described earlier, you add um, income taxes and, you, and other taxes that private companies have to pay, and you add a rate of return that they, their, uh, equity shareholders will expect to get. And probably higher debt costs as well. So it is very, very hard to make a case for that particular model of privatization. So the other, along the other, so that's sort of the, uh, that's a dichotomous thing, who owns the assets. The other forms of privatization involve um, private management. And it's a, uh, that there's not a clear case. I always, I, I think that also raises regulatory concerns because whenever you introduce a, a profit-oriented uh, entity, 
that may, there may be benefits to that. There may be some opportunities there. We have to be cognizant that th these are still monopolies, and so you're introducing some new elements to that equation that sounds like you're well aware of. So um, Eric and I, you know, there are 50,000 water systems in this country, so you've got every possible example of good, bad, big, large, small, various ownership models, uh, regionalization models, wholesale, retail. There's, good, there's many good examples, and then there's many not so good examples. So I think you have to craft a, um, a solution that makes sense. Again, trying to aim towards that optimized service level. You have to have an open mind. But I certainly, I'm of the camp that you don't uh, use privatization or anything else as a panacea. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes, I'd like to ask. Uh, Dr. Rothstein, I, as you made those comments, which I really appreciate because it seemed like it was very um, customer friendly. And we have heard that throughout the city, especially with customer service, if there was just a little bit uh, willingness to hear a customer when they come in as to their situation, maybe you're still going to have to give them the bad answer, you know, that we, we can't alleviate what they want but at least take the time to show some type of empathy to them because we are all in this boat together. And I'm sure a number of these employees also live in the city. So, but they're used to hearing the stories. We are not, we are not used to being in the situation. So that has always been brought up. I'm glad to hear that you <coughs> recognizing that is a way to make things a little bit more easier to uh, work with. But uh, I, I think we have to be always aware because right now the cry in this community is why pay for water that we can't use and we can't drink? And it's very hard to justify that when you have to explain that if there's going to be a change in rates and so forth. Another thing, and I noticed it wasn't really brought out and maybe it's really not part of the study, but we have to be aware of it. We have a lot of old meters, water meters in the houses that are not functioning properly, people's bills are sometimes estimated above what their normal usage is, and people feel that they have to pay for it because they don't understand that it could be a meter fault, and I feel that's really the fault of the city because their intentions uh, several years ago was to go and replace every meter, but because of our financial situation, we don't have the staffing, uh, I don't even know if we have the ability to get all the meters that need to be replaced. And I know in situations I've dealt with with citizens, when there's all of a sudden this outrageous bill and then checking into their accounts and so forth, then they realize, hey, that's an old uh, meter. They go make the adjustment and then it starts coming out with normal figures that they're used to. But it's like uh, right away the blame is, well, you probably got a leak in the house, or probably the toilet is not working right, you know. Uh, if they would just look at the account right away and see how old that meter is, and think of that as being one of the top issues. So I think that would help people feel better that if they're going to pay, they're going to pay at the right price. And also, on page 10, the amounts that are entered there, is that for a family of four or five, or is that... A person of one. If it's a pie chart, it's a. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I thought that was the number. Oh, it's, yeah, it's going to be out of sync, I guess, with these. <coughs> no, nope. that's the Rock uh, data. The Rock uh, chart that you had for a. For a oh, the, bill. the 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 uh, allocation of the the costs under Rock That's that's what they're calling a typical bill for 37. Uh, 100 gallons, um, so, right, so their time, it's a little bit of a weird construct, um, but, uh, or, oh, actually, that's the total budget one, but the 50, it's the 53, the 62, 53, I think is based on their, um, try the next one. Okay, right there, it says 53 and 4, is yeah. that for a family of? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's irregardless of family, 3,740 gallons, of water per month, which is on the low, that's on the low side. Um, so that would be, but you actually do see in Flint relative, uh, relatively low 
water use patterns? Uh, let me speak to uh, your question about the customer service issue. Um, the water utility industry um, has only recently, this is just generally, and, uh, and I think it is true here as well, started to recognize that customer service is a profession that we need to provide adequate training for, um, and that there, in, in many utilities, people that were customer service representatives were, in some cases, were field workers who got hurt and had to keep a, and they needed to keep working, so they were put behind a, a, a screen and doing customer service work. Um, nothing to say wrong about that, but they weren't being trained for that. Um, and so, uh, all of those sorts of issues about how to deal with um, billing estimations, how to deal with problems, how to deal with making appropriate adjustments, um, has not been something that has often been trained well among utilities. The really well-performing utilities in this country do so. They take, they've, they've embraced the notion that the first contact with customers, with, our, with the people that we're serving, is the customer service representatives, and so we need to train them um, in, in, a, in a professional manner. Um, in Detroit, for example, where we're going to work on this, this is a huge issue. Just getting through to the, to the actual, uh, through the phones is difficult enough, but then when you get on the other end, oftentimes the response is that it's not where we want to be. We're trying to uh, embrace what we've adopted as a, as a phrasing of compassionate customer service. We're talking about in, in Detroit trying to go beyond the utility standard, recognizing that our population has a tremendously uh, significant uh, low income population. And so when people are calling concerned about their water bills, it's not just their water bills. And so we're trying to provide some training around what are the other resources in the communities that, can, that they can access to help uh, with, their, with problems that are not necessarily water related, but, are certain, but their water related issues are symptomatic of those larger issues. Um, that takes a big effort. It's not something that just sort of, you know, you tell the, the customer service representatives, it'd be a good idea. We need a, we, there's specific training that needs to be done to make sure that that capacity is in place. Governor? Yeah, I just ask you to, one good model to look at is actually what we did with um, gas and electric at the state level, because that was an area where we had some ability to influence that, that the water piece is behind because it's a municipal issue generally in terms of how it operates. And so what we did at the state level is they used to have to, before they could provide assistance, they used to have to shut people off. And that was stupid. So we actually went and changed the whole procedure at the state level, and that was the practice for decades. Um, so we changed the practice so they could actually work with people before the shutoffs. So we dropped, dramatically dropped by, I think it had to be more than half, well more than half, I believe, the number of shutoffs that took place for utilities for gas and electric in the state um, by simply doing better practices, doing working with the utility companies to better understand you shouldn't have to go through this dramatic shut off, turn on with all this fees, rather than saying if you got a problem, figure out you just go work with people. That, and that was just common sense. Um, and so we've been doing that for a number of years. That was a practice I think we started back in 2012 or 2013. So we'd be happy to get you additional information on how you can look at some of that. Right, and if I could go further with what you just said. In our committee meetings, that has been brought up is like, why can't we be more like how consumer energy works with their customers? They don't turn them off. They work with them. They're flexible. They set up arrangements. And as to the city and the water situation, we need to also do the same thing. So what has happened at that level, we're looking at as an example, hopefully, that the city will follow. Yeah, and to go to Eric's point, that didn't exist in their industry until we worked with them in the last just handful of years. Because that wasn't prior practice right. before I took office. I, I know that because we actually worked with them to change it because it didn't make any common sense. So we'd be happy to get you connected with the other utility work we're doing outside of the water area. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Atisha. 
Sure, thank you guys. It's, it's amazing to have two really international experts here with us to, to talk about this. So thank you for being here. This was amazing. And I've seen this graph before and every time I see it, my, my jaw drops. And, and especially at one of our last meetings where it was discussed that rates might even double in the future with the, what's happening with KWA. Um, and you mentioned how this is unprecedented and you mentioned that it should be a public health service. And, um, and you mentioned that we need time for the dust to settle. Um, do you see, and I, I love what you said about maybe a three to five year, like fixed rate. Um, has there been any precedent anywhere for, for no water bills? Um, I really feel the people of Flint shouldn't have to pay for the water for the next decade. Um, I mean, like, can we go back to $27? Like, is it impossible? Like, in, in your, you know, expertise and in, in your work, like, what, how else can we be out of the box and recognize this trauma that we have been through, this amazing graph, and, and move forward? And I think this is, doing this would rebuild so much trust in the community, and it's almost a form of reparation when we talk about this larger kind of truth and reconciliation that the people of need to be going through. I think there are options, and I think, I think this is a, we're having a global conversation about water as a human right and about ac universal access. Um, some in some countries, the thought of shutoff is just unheard of. They, you know, they'll put a flow restrictor. They'll do some other things. Um, but we also, we also, right now, we're in, we're very concerned about our um, environmental impact, and so that's why you know it's trying to get this right balance, right? Because if you when you uh, we, we price things partly to you know make for sus financially sustainable systems and to provide that public health service. Um, but we also do it to send good signals so that we're not wasteful and we don't end up overbuilding and, you know, right, and overusing our natural resources, including energy. And energy is a big part of what water systems do. Um, but I tend to agree with you. I, and, and from an economic perspective, having the system financially self-sufficient gets you to a, you know, uh, meets the criteria of, of economic viability. How you allocate those costs is a policy decision. And I, I have no problem personally having the conversation that you're raising, and that is what would be a fair rate. You know, in the regul in, even in the regulated world, we have a standard of just and reasonable, and even beyond that, an issue of the issue of fairness. And you know, I'm in Hazlitt. My, I pay less than this for three months of service, water and wastewater. I don't think that's fair. So I, I am perfectly comfortable having that conversation and figuring out how to move us that way. And, but to, uh, for exactly the reason you raised, and that's rebuilding trust and confidence and, and, and understanding why we, we pay the rate. Okay, so we're going to have to cut this conversation. We're at 1030 right now. Um, this is not going to be the last time we're going to have this conversation on rates. It, we're, we're probably going to have it at several other meetings. So I, you know, I apologize for those who wanted to jump into this. I want to thank uh, Dr. Beecher and also uh, Mr. Rothstein for, for taking their time to come here. Uh, they are truly international experts on this stuff, and so we're, we're again, like Dr. Tisha said, we're fortunate to have them. You have on your agenda, the next meeting is on the November the 4th, uh, and I'll send out uh, some a, a questionnaire to you all regarding the meeting schedule for 2017. We want to have a little discussion there. We, ought to, we, are, we are out of time right now. And so with that, I'll turn things over for Governor uh, for final remarks. In. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, I just, again, reiterate, I want to thank Michigan State for hosting us. I want to thank Michigan State for a great presentation. So thank you for coming to share your expertise. I, I just want to thank AARP for their continuing work. Um, again, you've been very diligent, a very good partner on working these issues. Um, hopefully people viewed we had a healthy discussion today about all the action items going on. Obviously it's more work to be done including everything from water services to long term water supply um, and let's just keep working these issues. So I appreciate people's attendance today and let's keep our sleeves rolled up and keep working. Yeah. Well, stand adjourned.